Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Is Sri Lanka in danger of slipping into anarchy? Never in my life have I seen similar scenes in any South Asian country with the exception of Afghanistan. So today we ask, what is the actual situation on the ground in Colombo? And more importantly, what does the future hold for Sri Lanka? Those are the two key, two key issues I shall raise today with the Executive Director of Sri Lanka Center for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Paikya Soti Saravanamattu. Dr. Saravanamattu, Dr. President Gotabia Rajapaksa has fed the country for the Maldives, and it's now widely believed that, in fact, he could move on further to either Singapore or to the UAE. But the critical point is he still has not resigned as president. More importantly, he's used his powers under Article 37.1 of the Sri Lankan Constitution to appoint Ranil Vikramasinghe, the Prime Minister, as acting president. And this is absolutely unacceptable to the protesters. It's unacceptable to opposition politicians. And thirdly, yesterday, the Prime Minister's official residence was virtually overrun by thousands, whilst by and large, security forces simply stood by and let them do it. So let me start by asking you, is there a power vacuum in Colombo? There seems to be a power vacuum insofar as the Mr. Anil Vikramasinghe, who is the Prime Minister and who has been made the acting president, is not recognized as such by the leaders of the opposition as well as the protesters out in the street. So Gotabe Rajpaksa's inability and willingness to submit his letter of resignation to the speaker is effectively holding the country to ransom and creating an unprecedented constitutional and political crisis. Today, the opposition leaders are again to meet at a meeting convened by the speaker to consider what the options are. And I suppose they will have to now move outside of the constitution because there is no provision in the constitution for such a situation. The acting president is there by appointment of the sitting president, who now is not in the country. So to remove the acting president, parliament presumably can act, but it must act with a substantial majority and a substantial consensus of its members in order to effect any kind of change. If that letter comes, then of course the speaker can proceed with the process of electing a new president and indeed a new government and getting on with the business of government. But if the all party meeting that is going to be held later today has to act outside the constitution, then is the country not coming very close to what I suppose could be called anarchy? Because then the rules, procedures, traditions and conventions that should apply will no longer exist. They'll be made up on the hoof. No, absolutely. Absolutely. They are going to be made up on the hoof because if they are not going to accept Ranil Vikramasinghe as the acting president, and if Gotabe Rajpaksa's letter hasn't come, we are at a total deadlock. The people in the country, as far as the protesters exemplify that public opinion, do not want Ranil Vikramasinghe as acting president. 
They do not want him as prime minister either. The leaders of the opposition political parties have said that he should resign. So we are at a deadlock. The only way that that can be resolved is if parliament acts. And I said, parliament acts with a considerable majority underpinning it to provide it a certain degree of legitimacy. Because if that's not the case, the next target of the protesters is going to be parliament. Tell me, is there a danger that Ranil Vikramasinghe will want to hold on to the job that he's been handed by Gotabi Rajapaksa, that of acting president? Because clearly, Vikramasinghe has tried many times to become president in his own right and failed to do so. Now that he's been gifted the job by a president who's fled, will he do everything to hold on to it? Is that a sense in which his ambition comes in the way of the situation? Well, Vikramasinghe has said that as soon as an interim government is set up on the assumption that Gotabe Rajpaksa would have submitted his letter of resignation, that he would turn over everything to that interim government. So him leaving, as it were, office has been sort of guaranteed by his promise that he would hand over powers to an interim government. But now that is not going to happen unless, of course, the letter is received. Now, the point with regard to Mr. Vikramasinghe holding on to offices is, is that as long as he does that, the protest will only intensify. As and if the protest intensifies, he may then order the army out against them. Hasn't the situation changed somewhat from the point at which Ranil Vikramasinghe offered to step aside as prime minister if an alternate prime minister could be appointed by parliament. He made that condition or that offer when he was prime minister. Now he made it as prime minister. Absolutely. Now he's acting president. And what he said yesterday in his speech was to ask the speaker to appoint to a appoint. consensus prime minister who has the support both of the government as well as of the opposition. That seems to suggest that he envisages the possibility of staying on as president himself but he's only vacating the prime ministership. Isn't there a danger that in a real sense, now that he's got his hands on the presidency, which he wanted, he's trying his best to hold on to it? Well, if he does try to hold on to it, and given the level of protest, the intensity of the protests outside, we could be heading towards a situation in which there could be bloodshed. Because the protests will intensify. They will try to make the country ungovernable under his acting presidency or whatever. And as a consequence, then he will have to come out and put the army out against the protesters. Already he has talked about fascist elements within the protest movement that have infiltrated the protest movement, etc. So he will then set the army out against them if the army agrees to obey those orders. If there's a danger that his obstinacy, and I'm deliberately using that word obstinacy, could lead to violence and bloodshed, you use the word bloodshed, then isn't Sri Lanka coming very close to some form of anarchy? No, it is. It is. If this is going to be resolved at the end of the day, only through bloodshed, and there is the possibility, therefore, of the military taking a much more larger role as far as the governance of the country is concerned, yes, we are heading to a situation of bloodshed. We're heading to an authoritarian future where we, we may well have a government that is no longer civilian or democratic. I mean, the, the consequences are really quite dire. You're speaking about events moving in a direction where the army or the military may step in. But in a sense, hasn't that already happened? In the address that he gave the country yesterday, Ranil Vikrama Singh said, and I'm quoting, I've given all the necessary powers to the military to bring stability. Doesn't that amount to military rule behind Vikrama Singh's civilian facade? Yes, giving the military carte blanche to act in whichever way they want to, on the grounds that they have to restore law and order, is effectively giving them total freedom of action without any kind of restrictions. And that, of course, is highly, highly dangerous because people will get killed. In fact, he's also appointed a special committee of military chiefs who will operate without political interference. 
So in fact, not only has he handed them all the powers that they want, but he's also ensured that this committee of military chiefs can operate without political interference. We're coming very close to Ranil Vikramasinghe hanging on to the acting presidency, but actually handing over power to the military to run the situation without political interference as they deem and see fit. No, absolutely. And at the, the alternative is also um, fairly distressing insofar as if Vikramasinghe was to resign as acting president, he used to resign as, act as prime minister, then what happens? Because the president is still there. That letter of resignation is absolutely crucial to allowing the constitutional processes to take effect. So at the one hand, you have the possibility or the probability indeed of military government, of bloodshed, all of that. And on the other hand as well, you have the whole question of an absolute stalemate. If the speaker is going to take over the reins of interim president, again, there is no constitutional provision for him to do so because the president, as long as he is the president of the country, is the person who has to appoint the acting president. Absolutely. Let's explore this stalemate or this standoff between the speaker on the one hand and Ranil Vikramasinghe on the other, because I think much of the problem that lies at the heart of the present situation arises out of this standoff. Ranil Vikramasinghe has been appointed acting president by the present president because Gotabe Rajapaksha is still president. He hasn't resigned. And therefore, constitutionally, under Article 37.1, Ranil Vikramasinghe is legally the acting president. On the other hand, at the all party meeting yesterday, it was decided that Ranil Vikramasinghe will not be recognized as acting president and that the speaker wants to become acting president himself. But there are no constitutional means for the speaker to put that into effect. So we have, in addition to the fact that Vikramasinghe is handing over increasing powers to the military without political interference, we also have side by side a civilian standoff between Ranil Vikramasinghe opposition party politicians and the speaker. We have two problems existing simultaneously. Absolutely. And the only way that it can be resolved is locally. But of course, that's not a satisfactory position because the president of the country is out of the country. But it can only be resolved if parliament is convened and parliament by a two-thirds majority votes in terms of what the next step ought to be, whether the president is going to be the, the speaker, whether he's going to be the interim president, whether he's going to be able to form an interim government, all of those things parliament would take into its hands. And effectively, they must act, therefore, with a strong majority and on the premise that Gotabe Rajpaksa is no longer the president of the country. I'll come to parliament in a moment's time. But first, let's focus on both the steps that Ranul Vikramasinghe has taken as acting president, as well as the things that he said. The first thing he did was to declare a national emergency. He then declared a curfew in the Western province. But late last night, he expanded that curfew island wise. A, were those steps necessary? And B, how have they gone down with the protesters? No, they have gone down very badly with the protesters and the protesters have ignored the curfew and in the emergency and all of that, because as far as they're concerned, these were attempts to suppress their protests, their demonstrations. So, you know, Vikramasinghe's office, first of all, said that there was going to be a curfew in the Western province and an all-island emergency, even before it was announced that he had been appointed acting president. You know, so there was a sort of a haste with which to do that. And I suppose that was on the grounds that the situation would deteriorate considerably and that we had to have a semblance of government in place before the letter was to be received. Now, we waited the entirety of yesterday for the letter from Gotabe Rajpaksa to come as promised. Now it hasn't happened. So we are in an entirely new situation in the sense where the president's promise to resign is not taking place. Ranil Vikramasinghe is in charge as the acting president. He has given carte blanche to the military to act in whatever way they think is necessary to maintain law and order. And the opposition parties are calling upon the speaker to take over as the interim president. Isn't there a third dimension to the two problems that we've already discussed? 
The third dimension is this. Last night, from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. this morning, there was an island-wise curfew. But as you said a moment ago, it was ignored by the protesters. If that curfew was ignored, and it's the army's duty to enforce the curfew, that then becomes defiance of the military. Isn't there then the possibility of a standoff or a divide between the military on the one hand and the protesters who refuse to obey the curfew? The military on the ground are maintaining that they will not shoot at the protesters. But certainly, water cannon and tear gas has been used against the protesters. But if it gets to the point in which there is that clear-cut standoff, where the protesters are defying the curfew and the army is there or the police is there to maintain the curfew and the law and order, yes, then you could have very serious consequences. Now, let's come to something that Ranil Vikramasinghe said yesterday in his address to the country. He referred to the protesters as fascists. His exact words were, and I'm quoting him in English, we can't allow fascists to take over. We must end this fascist threat to democracy. Do people in Sri Lanka, do you yourself, look upon the protesters as fascists? No, I don't. I don't. But there is always a possibility that elements could have infiltrated the protests to create mischief, to damage their reputation, to provide fodder to the government to turn around and say that the fascists are the ones who are taking the lead as far as the protests are concerned. The important thing about the protests in Sri Lanka was that it was entirely peaceful. It was, they provided a vision at Goldface of what Sri Lanka could and should be like. It was an entirely safe, peaceful, non-violent activity. So this notion that there are that they are fascists. If there are fascists, the people in the protest movement should identify them through processes of self-discipline, self-regulation, whatever, and read them out. But I do not believe at all that the protests are fascists. Tell me something. How much credibility does Ranil Vikramasinghe as an individual have today? I'm well aware of the fact that he failed to win his own constituency in the elections in 2019, and he only became an MP because of the proportional representation which gave him a seat on the party list. Nonetheless, although he came from a one-man party, he ended up as prime minister. And now, because of a gift from the fleeing president, he's ended up as acting president. How much credibility does this man have given his immediate political background? Well, as a consequence of his past experience and having been prime minister for six years, I suppose there is a constituency that believes that because of his expertise and experience, he might be able to get us back on track. But I think the vast majority of people in this country believe that he's a failure, that he's diabolical in terms of his machinations, that he has thrown a lifeline to the Rajpaksas, and therefore that he is part of and very representative of a discredited and decrepit political elite. In which case, tell me, how much worse has he made his own position by that speech that he made yesterday on television, where he A, called the protesters fascists, and B, where he declared a national emergency, and then to begin with a curfew in the Western province, which was eventually extended to an island-wise curfew. If that hasn't gone down well with politicians, if it hasn't gone down well with protesters, has he made his already very precarious and tenuous position even worse by his own actions and his own words? Well, very possibly it could have been the case, and therefore we will have to look to the security forces for protection. Which means that he needs the same level of protection that President Gotabia Rajapaksa needed before he fled from the army. He's in danger of his own life and his own survival. That could possibly be the case if the protest intensifies. That could possibly be the case. Let's come to Parliament. According to the schedule laid down a few days ago by the Speaker, it is supposed to meet on the 15th, which is tomorrow. 
nominations for whoever will be the new interim president for the remaining period of Gotabi Rajabaksha's term have to come in by the 19th and the election is scheduled for the 20th. Will all of that happen or in the present circumstances, in the present uncertainty, given the standoff between Vikramasinghe and the speaker and the opposition politicians, is that all now in doubt? Well, this is up to parliament and the opposition leaders to make that decision. They are supposed to be meeting again today. They will have to take that decision whether in the absence of the letter of resignation from Gotabe Rajpaksa, they are willing and able to still proceed with the process of electing a new president. As you said, they would have to find ways that circumvent or go around the constitution to be able to do what they Absolutely. want to do. But the problem is, they'll still come up against the fact that Ranil Vikramasinghe has been constitutionally under Article 37, one of the Sri Lankan constitution appointed acting president by the still existing president. At that point of time, if he refuses to budge, what happens? Well, it is a very serious situation because if he refuses to budge, then he will have to be taken out of office, either by the protesters or the new dispensation that has come into being with the speaker and the leaders of the opposition political parties. We'll have to get the forces of law and order to get him out of office as well. You know, there is no other way in which the situation can be resolved because the country needs a government, it needs a leader. In those circumstances, so, what will happen if the military, particularly the chief of defense staff, stand by him? After all, they may say that he is the constitutionally appointed acting president. And if you're going to be constitutional in your manner and behavior, then the army has a duty, not just of loyalty, but of constitutional responsibility to stand by the acting president. Then what happens? In that situation of extreme standoff, there is every prospect that it's only bloodshed that will resolve the situation. Unfortunately and sadly, that is the case. You know, Dr. Sarvan Muttu, the audience hearing you will have come to the conclusion that not only has the constitutional crisis in Sri Lanka become a lot worse than it was 24, 36 hours ago, but actually the situation is a mess. There is no clear cut way of resolving the situation. The speaker has to use means that are circumventing or going around the constitution. The question arises, will they be acceptable? Ranil Vikramasinghe can claim that he's been constitutionally appointed, but he's not wanted by the protesters. He's not wanted by the opposition politicians. You have an absolute horrible mess on your hands. That's absolutely correct. There is no denying that. There is no possible pathway that one can identify in the absence of the letter of resignation from Gota Beraj Paksa, which will be constitutional in terms of getting out of this mess. It's now in the realm of politics. The other amazing thing is that by handing over power temporarily to Ranil Vikramasinghe as acting president under the powers that he has under Article 37.1, President Gotabe Rajapaksa seems to suggest that he's only temporarily absenting himself from Colombo, that at some point he envisages returning and assuming the presidency again. Isn't that the assumption behind the fact that he's only appointed an acting president and not resigned himself? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are lots of people, myself included, who thinks he's living in an absolute fantasy. I don't think Gotabe Rajapaksa can return to this country, but he is assuming that having left things in Ranil Vikramasinghe's hands, that some notion of law and order and stability will be restored to Sri Lanka and he can come back as the president of the country. So even in the last dying moments of his presidency, Gotabe Rajapaksha is doing everything to ensure A, he can cling on for as long as possible, but B, to bedevil the situation in his country. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is the nature of the man.
and of the family. My last question in that case, given the terrible conundrum, it's like a Gordian knot which has to be sliced with the sword rather than unpicked. Wouldn't it be easier for everyone to agree the constitution has become dysfunctional because of the way Rajapaksa has behaved and because of the way Ranil Vikramasinghe refuses to move and therefore consensus needs to be reached with the military to find a solution to circumvent the fact that you have a sitting acting president who believes he's constitutionally appointed so that the speaker can take over and a whole new system can be put in place thereafter. Absolutely. We have to recognize that the constitution is dysfunctional, that it has no relevance, has got nothing to say about these dire exceptional circumstances that we are in. And we have to have a consensus that we need a new constitution, a new social contract for the country. A consensus for a new constitution and a new social contract. That's probably, is it not easier said than done? It's easy to envisage... Right. It's very difficult to put in place. Nothing in terms of a possible resolution of the situation that Sri Lanka is in at the present moment is easy. You know, I've come to the end of this interview, but I suspect the sentiment in the minds of the audience after listening to your brutally frank answers will be, God help Sri Lanka. It's a country that needs God's help very much at the moment, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I put my faith in the notion that at the end of the day, there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. We will come back. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Dr. Saravanamutu, thank you very much for this eye-opening, if dismaying, interview. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.